to introduce to you and bring to you the 30th Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Dave Berger. Sir? Uh, Chuck was telling me that the microphone is really weak, and I have seen him in karaoke before, so I'm on a scale of yeah, here to a, a bar in the Philippines, I'll stay close to the microphone. What he didn't tell you about the, uh, his retirement ceremony, you probably noticed we, uh, we've commented on this before, about the similarity in barbers, hairstyles. So uh, after the ceremony, and actually he did give me back the handkerchief in front of everybody, thank you very much, uh, soaking wet. Uh, he, some, there were two Marines that came up and talked to him and me while we were standing there talking afterwards. And uh, I, don't, I don't even know who it was, but it was, uh, they, they were maybe in their 30s. One was a Marine and the other one, I don't know, a girlfriend or his wife or something like that. Asked the, the kind of question that comes out of the blue to him. He said, like, after congratulations and all, and maybe they worked for you, but they said, like, sir, I just got to ask you, you know, and you never know what's coming after that, but uh, that's sort of like, with all due respect, and you never know. Uh, but anyway, they asked, they said, uh, sir, I just got to ask you, do you, do you cut your own hair? Like, and he didn't, he didn't miss a beat. He, Ch Chuck just said, if, if your backyard looked like this, would you pay somebody to mow it? And like I said, that's good. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, for the war, you do owe me a handkerchief. Thank you for uh, a really warm uh, welcome this afternoon. It is, when, I, when you walk in here and, and uh, see all of the uh, old friends that you have grown up with, and uh, probably I shouldn't say old, apologize for that, but uh, these are people that I've known for 30, 40 years. It's really, really a good feeling. And this year, as Chuck said, before I get into my comments, the, this year is a huge year. It is not a small feat to become a national military association. And there was three years of hard work by people in here and others that made it possible because the Marine Corps never had one. We just never have. Now we do. That's a huge step 100 years later, right? So I'm, as a commandant, I'm just very grateful that that idea from three years ago didn't just go in somebody's in basket that you all really worked hard at it. And this year's the first year, right? This, this uh, lunch is the first luncheon where you are a national military association. So congratulations. <laughs> now that's, that's a huge milestone. You already know that, but with or without a designation, and it's a huge one, but even if you didn't have that, from my perspective, I would guess probably most of you all too, this association has always uh, accomplished the mission. Uh, just like the Marines that you all literally serve. And I mean that when I say that. I have been a Marine for a few years, as have uh, s several others of you. I, I don't know how you could overstate the impact of this association on our core over a hundred year period. You would be really hard to overstate that. And I say that not uh, just because uh, Chuck paid me to say that, which he, he hasn't yet. Um, but the fact is, and Chuck rattled off a couple of them, but those of us who get the opportunity to travel around from everywhere from the modern day Marine to the awards ceremonies, to the dinners, you visit units like we get to, like Sergeant Major and me get to, and you see the professional development that they carried with them, like 312 in Camp Fuji on deployment. I mean, they're in the field, two artillery platoons with their howitzers shooting live fire, and they, they brought like the Marine Corps Association with them. They don't call it that, but you can see it. That's, that's what winning looks like, right? These guys are deployed for a long time, a month at Camp Fuji, and they're, they're learning, their professional development hasn't stopped because you made it possible. That's, this association, in other words, is integral, not a bolt-on, but it's integral to, I think, to the professional development 
of today's Marines. And they're, they're all, all those parts are important. Uh, all the different functions that the aviation or the association does, but I'm going to talk for a couple minutes about just one aspect of that, and that's the Marine Corps Gazette. And then I'll circle back um, at the end. As uh, Chuck mentioned, most everybody in here knows the history there, right? General Lejeune, a little bit more than 100 years ago. Um, we're talking 1916. This was going to be the professional journal of the Marine Corps. What a vision. And he wrote down, and I brought it with me. This is the purpose. This is 1916. How? You know, how some people have a vision into the future. For This is his words. For the free exchange of ideas, professional debate, and a discussion of the issues of greatest importance to the, to the core. That's a mission statement for a magazine in 1916. Every bit as relevant uh, I would offer to you today. Guys like Chuck and me and Smoke, I, I started reading the Gazette in 1981. Didn't have a choice because when we went to the basic school, we did uh, join the association. We did subscribe. Wasn't optional. I'm glad it wasn't. And we carried around in our wallet a membership card that we got at TBS very proudly for years after that. That was that was like today's cat card. You had your membership card in your pocket. You were part of the association. And for me, I wasn't a part of any other association. That was the card. In the 80s, you all, many of the folks in this room remember the 1980s, the debate in the 1980s on maneuver warfare. We vigorously ripped that apart, put it back together. And Chris is nodding his head back there because Woody knows that was a true debate, right? We remember, we look at it now like it was a foregone thing, like it was automatic. Absolutely no. All of the 1980s was fantastic debate. And for every advocate, and we know who they were, there was an opponent. Just like, uh, just like today, there was uh, Bill Lynn, General Al Gray, Michael Wiley on one side, and the same number of people on the other side saying they have it wrong. And we read all of that in the 1980s for several years. It was fascinating. It was a place to discuss and debate, as General Lejeune put it, the big ideas. And I think over the years, the journal itself, the Gazette, has changed in its format some in a good way. But the fundamental function that General Lejeune had in mind in 1916 has not changed. It is remarkably consistent. This is the forum for new ideas. This is the place for debate. And for me personally, as a commandant, it has been a place over the past three years where I go to for fresh thinking, and it has been a trigger for my own curiosity. I'm going to share why. Probably not a surprise to the folks uh, in this room, but I would tell you that the issues that are discussed in the pages of the Gazette have helped me shape my priorities as commandant. And I'm going to tell you sort of how, give you some examples. Um, and, and as I rattle through these pretty quickly, they'll ring a bell to you, especially Woody and, and a few others. 2017, this is five years ago. Captain, uh, he goes by call sign OSHA Morin. I read his article on Big Wing UAS. This is this is in 2017, how the Marine Corps needed to go in that direction of big wing UAS. Uh, his article, if you remember it, don't fear the reaper. That was the article. Two years before I became commandant, that article won the award that year, right? The Chase Essay Award. Lieutenant Colonel uh, James Hammond, go back further, 2014. He was writing about the critical need for us to understand a, a full cost ownership, and you remember this uh, discussion, across all of our aviation portfolio, but he was talking about the, all of the costs, not just procurement, and, and then how that needed to relate to other parts of the MAGTAF. 2014, he's talking about full ownership cost of entire portfolios. A couple of years ago, and the first, just after uh, I became uh, commandant, 
several officers teamed up to write an article. This one probably will ring a bell as well for many of you. Scott Kumo, uh, Spataro, Major Cummings, uh, Captain Garrard. And this is 2019. They challenged in that article the relevance of two Marine Expeditionary Brigade uh, as an assault element, as sort of that's our planning construct for joint forcible entry. And they said it's out of date. 2019. These are where the ideas for me churn. Stand-in forces, written by a true friend I would offer to you of the association and the rest of us, Art Corbett, who we lost. This is 2019, Art Corbett. He had a big idea uh, that we could actually create, this is how A2 AD, this was his thinking, this is how we're going to create an advantage over an adversary by staying, in his words, inside the weapons engagement zone. Sound familiar? Inside the West. This is Art Corbett writing this. Before I'd ever gotten off the ground with anything force design, he said we should stay in there when everybody else, when the adversary expects us to withdraw, that we would stay in there and not just survive, but fight and win. He, he called it, we, should, we can be able to fight tonight in perpetuity. This guy, Art, had a vision. He, he could see where we needed to go. He was trying to, I think, address a bigger, larger operational problem, and he knew that the Gazette was the place to launch this debate and, and really open it up for examination, and he did that. And I would offer to you just as important it is, has been to me to define uh, the priorities for the Marine Corps, also a place for me to refine. This debate has helped me make adjustments. I think I counted up. I don't know how many altogether, but I would guess there's more than a dozen and a half articles over the past 18 months on talent management, on people. This is helping me refine where we need to go. Just in that short amount of time, the breadth of ideas covered and the depth of the authors, the Marine authors expertise really is helping me think, help us think through how we handle our people, which is our number one, you know, that's nothing more important, how we do that in the future. Major Jacob Clayton and uh, Mike Nakazoni, who re work, works right now for the Assistant Commandant, remember his title, Rethinking Mobile Reconnaissance. They help me refine, help CD and I down in Quantico help us refine what reconnaissance and counter reconnaissance might be because they're writing about it, they're debating it. And the same goes, I would offer for the more senior leaders. In the past year, year and a half, Dale Alford submitted a great article. Um, Dave Furness has been uh, published. Skirt Glavy, all of them, they contributed to the Gazette because they knew they. This is the place for that debate. And you and I get to benefit because there's decades of, of experience in there and they're tossing it on the table for a discussion. That takes confidence. Now, I don't always agree with everything that everybody writes, but it makes me think, makes you and me think. That's the power of it. You all weren't in the room, neither was I. But when General Conway was a commandant, he talked to Colonel Keenan, would he smile? And again, he said, and he, this, is the, this is the instructions he gave to Colonel Keenan. If I agree with half of the articles in the Gazette and I disagree with half, you're doing your job. That was his guidance. Well, that's powerful from a leader. How many CEOs would be happy for, with a 50-50 debate? In other words, he didn't want the Gazette behind him. He wanted it for what John Lejeune, I think, had in mind. The Commandant has a lot of people around them. Most of them bring you great news all day long. You might be surprised uh, to, when I tell you that sometimes general officers, not always, but sometimes they're reluctant to bring you the bad news. But you can, you and I can always count on a captain or a staff sergeant or a major in the Gazette to bring you what you don't want to hear. But you know you have to think about because it's written down and, it, and they'll do it in detail, 
right? Those articles are not up here because Chris, won't, he won't let them publish that. He requires them, requires them not just to, not just to identify a problem because I know he says, you were, I'm not going to publish this until you offer a solution. And I think that's what General Lejeune had in mind. There's a debate, but how are you going to fix it? Great. Identify the problem. But I think you have held true to, if you're willing to write in here a solution, we're willing to publish it. But if not, no. I think that's exactly what General Lejeune had. Woody and the rest of them help me think through things, two, three levels, four levels down. And that is invaluable for senior leaders today. I came into the Marine Corps 41 uh, years ago. We were talking about maneuver warfare then, General Gray, and it was debated. We didn't, the, the initial articles actually questioned whether that should be part of our future or not. It was, it's hard to remember back then, but it was a debate. Now, force design discussions in the future of the Marine Corps, the next 10, 12, 15 years, different problem set, same discussion, a lot of parallels. Today, same spirited debate about the future of the Marine Corps and the whole joint force and the Navy. And I think like earlier, like in the 1980s, when I was a lieutenant and a captain, captains and lieutenants want to be part of that discussion. They have opinions and they want to throw it on the table. I think it's awesome. They are turning our, that journal into a place to communicate ideas. I'm really happy, and I mean that, that the Gazette has, all these years later, stayed true. They fill that role for our service. And if you take a step back, I think it's worth pausing just, to, just a moment, think about the significance of our culture let's just say, and the way that it tolerates in the military, and especially the Marine Corps, debate. We don't just tolerate it, we encourage it. It's like a rugby scrum, and we like it, because that's how the best ideas get to the top. I don't think that's, the, I don't know about y'all, but when I travel around, that's not the same in all other military cultures. There's not a healthy debate, and you can see it when you travel to other nations and you meet with their leaders, and it's one story, there's no debate. I like the fact that, the, I'm very proud of the fact that our Marine Corps has a debate. That is our culture. I think we set the global standard there. We should be proud of it, we should celebrate it. Debate is healthy, it makes us stronger. Future. I think the future of the Gazette is strong. I think it, that's where our professional discourse happens today, it's going to be that in the future. A couple of thoughts along those lines. I think we should study hard Ukraine. But in a little bit expanded uh, sense, there's currently right now a really rich discussion on what we ought to learn from Ukraine. The Gazette is a perfect place to take that apart. I think we should cultivate that discussion. I think we should actually expand it. Here's what I mean. Most people think the conflict in Ukraine started this spring, but the Marines in here know it started in 2013-14 in Crimea. So we have been trying to understand this for eight, nine years now. That's a longer, broader discussion. And some of the lessons learned that we're seeing this spring and summer in Ukraine are new, but some, I think, are probably not, and they were identified years ago. I think it would be worthwhile capturing that whole eight, nine year period and seeing what's changed. What's the context? How do we catalog? How do we actually catalog the lessons learned from, from our perspective over a decade of fighting in Ukraine? But then I would offer go wider than that. Why don't we look broader? Why don't we look at Nagorno-Karabakh? Why don't we look at Ethiopia, Libya, Somalia, Syria, Philippines? And why don't we challenge the Marine Corps to say, in 10 years of conflict, what are the top 10 things we can learn? And if we did that, can you imagine what Marines would write? Now, I don't think any two Marines would submit the same list of 10. If you gave them that kind of 10 over 10 task, I don't think they would, two Marines would write the same list. But I can guarantee you pretty much, 
there'd be a lot of overlap, right? And you and I would be looking for the overlap. Wow, there's a trend here. These are lessons that we might want to study deeper, the overlap part. That, I think, will also help us move the Marine Corps where we need to go. This is how we study ongoing conflicts and feed it back into the Marine Corps as it's happening. And the Gazette is a vehicle for this. How about TDGs, tactical decision games? How many people, don't raise your hands, played them when, when they were lieutenants, captains, majors? I did. Uh, I didn't always finish them, in all honesty, Chuck. If you, I didn't finish all of them. But I always studied them. I always read them. I tried to think my way through them. I think those scenarios, they help remind me, you know, at the tactical level, how difficult our, our uh, tactical leader's job is, what responsibility is on a platoon commander, a platoon sergeant, so, you know, what's on their shoulders. Now, okay, this is 2022. What if there were tactical decision games on a bigger scale? What if they involved all the domains of warfare right now and all the tools? From Hero 70s and uh, 120s, Big Wing UAS, uh, El Razum, Jagum. The, the systems, the whole MAGTAF part, the tools we have now and the tools we're getting. Organic precision fires. What if a tactical decision game could go into all of those domains with all of those tools? Challenge our Marines. And what if you went broader than that and you gave the reader the opportunity to draw on joint enablers, which they will. That's how we're going to fight. So what if we really engage their minds now and leverage that? And then you weave in signals, intelligence, cyber, and space. I think a TDG has like lots of room to grow. These are missions, in other words, mission sets that we're going to have to operate in the future. And a place like the Gazette is a perfect sort of incubator for that thinking, I believe. Then you weave in the concepts expeditionary advanced space operations, the Navy concepts, the joint warfighting concept, man, everything, all that mess on the table. It's great. I think the first ones that I did, most of them were on infantry, like the rifle squad, the rifle platoon. But what if we looked more narrowly and broader into fires, into cyber, into command and control, into logistics, which I would argue we're farthest behind on. What if a TDG was really stretching our brains on tactical to operational level logistics? Something really revolutionary. How about a TDG on aviation? That would be pretty amazing. It would make us think. I'm going to wrap up my uh, comments with just a couple thoughts. It was a tough summer in one respect for Marines because we lost. Three giants, Woody Williams, Sergeant Major Canley, and uh, Butch Neal. Three giants in, in our history. Two of them Medal of Honor recipients, and the other, of course, an assistant commandant. They told, you add those three together, I think that's a, that's part of, a big part of our Marine Corps story. And when you think about the lives of those three, just those three, good reminder to the rest of us how much we owe to our Marine veterans. That's my point. Once a Marine, always a Marine. It is not a bumper sticker we put on our car. We don't take them for granted. I'm just passing on to you that as your commandant, I, I have even more than three, four years ago come to value the service, the contributions, the coaching, the teaching, the mentoring of our Marine veterans. Really grateful for that. And this summer reminded me of that. Going and attending those funerals, I was thinking we can never take that for granted. A long way of saying that's where I started off about saying it's really great to see old friends. In this room, the veterans here, I need you. The Marine Corps needs you. We need your involvement, not from the bleachers, but be in the scrum. Be right in, the, be right in that chaotic mess of where the Marine Corps needs to go. I need you to stay involved. I value your opinions. This is an organization that's powered by Marines for Marines, I think. 
And I am very grateful for the association to give us a playing field. And the Gazette is one example of several that you highlighted. I'm very grateful for that as your commandant. Thank you very much, Semper Fidelis.